So our final presentation uh, is from Dr. Dalal al Sori, who is a consultant in uh, developmental and behavioral pediatrics and also the head of mental health services for Kids Heart in Abu Dhabi. So let's welcome her to the floor. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> Um, after a very eventful morning with a lot of sort of impressive lectures about intense brain tumors and cardiac transplants and of course nephrotic syndrome which was excellent um, we're going to take it down to something a little bit more low-key going back to the basics with developmental milestones and red flags okay so very very important and I think this is something we should all know as um, pediatricians. We must understand the normal path of childhood development in order to recognize the abnormal. This is key because it avoids unnecessary referrals to developmental pediatricians, psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, and so forth that already have quite a long wait list to get in to see them. And so getting familiar with normal developmental milestones is essential and I feel like it's the ABCs of any kind of pediatric training. So always have that in mind so that when a mother, for example, comes to you and is worried because her previous four-month-old who was super social in his grandmother's arms is now at six months terrified of her. And so I don't think that needs a referral to a developmental pediatrician. That's something that a, to a, a general pediatrician can address. And so we can avoid the unnecessary referrals. And that's just a brief example. Something beautiful about child development, and one of the things I love about the field, is that child development occurs in a predictable sequence. And so we sit before we stand. We walk before we run. And that's key. We have different developmental domains. Sorry, that's a little small. In general, the de developmental domains that we look at are gross motor skills, so those that in involve the large muscles, fine motor skills, those that involve the smaller muscles in the hands and in the rest of the body, language skills, cognitive skills, and social, emotional, and behavioral skills, which is kind of a big one um, for our field of developmental and behavioral pediatrics. I'm going to be focusing a lot on language development, less so on motor development, um, because I feel like about 70 to 80 percent of the referrals we used to get in the U.S. at the clinic was just purely language delays, amongst other delays, of course, um, but a big one was language development. And so what I was always trained to ask was, what do you ask when the chief complaint is language delay? Three main things. Can the child hear? And I know Dr. Zainab talked about this yesterday, getting a formal audiology evaluation and having that as proof, so a report. And no, my child can hear cocomelon from the next room is definitely not a formal audiology evaluation. And they do really need that um, clearance that they can hear all frequencies and pitches and tones um, appropriately. Can the child understand when they're spoken to? So when the main concern is language delay, what part of language is it? Are they not understanding? Are they not expressing? Is it both? Are you talking about their social language skills or their expressive language skills? So can they understand? Because this can also tell us something about the child's cognitive level. And we go into more and more of those disorders as well. And number three, how does the child play? Play, huge, 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 very underestimated thing that we look at. And I, I was speaking to some residents earlier today, and I said I could watch a child play for a good hour, hour and a half at my clinic, and learn so much more than just that brief 15 minutes. And I know a lot of our clinics, we can't really spend that much time, but just watching them play for a good hour, watching, is there pretend play? Are they imagining? Are they repetitive? Are those rote skills that they're using? What are they saying to you? Are they making eye contact? Are they not? Are they pointing if they're not speaking or they're not using words? How are they communicating? And so I know I touched upon this a little bit. Language um, can be categorized into expressive language skills and receptive language skills. And language skills are the, 
single best indicator of intellectual ability, and we're talking about receptive language primarily. And among school-aged children who have specific language impairments, about 50% of them will also have a learning disorder involving reading. So this is also affecting school skills and academic skills. So just a quick question out there, a raise of hands to anyone who, and, and again, there's no embarrassment to this, it's, it's totally fine. Does expressive language, is that equivalent to speech? Does anyone believe that, that it's equivalent to speech? Perfect, I don't see hands, which is awesome. You guys are all developmental pediatricians, which is nice. Speech is just a single form of expressive language, just one single form. It's the production of a specific motor skill. So the, it's a complex control of airflow that is combined with a specific mouth shape and the position of the tongue. And then you get the vocalizations. So impairments in motor planning and execution or anatomical abnormalities can impair speech, yet spare other language abilities. Expressive language can come in many forms. We talked about speech. What about gestures, manual signs, facial expressions, body postures, pictures? If you've heard of PECs, picture exchange systems, or the, the cards that kiddos with autism use to express their wants and needs, that's all expressive language. They may not be saying words, but them pointing to pictures or gesturing or, or even using sign language, that's also a form of expressive language. Diagrams and written symbols. So a child who's hearing impaired, for example, so although they're not speaking, they can use signs and express themselves. That's also an expressive form of language. So how do we assess expressive language? Rather than using, and this is a, a mistake that I'm guilty of when I first started training, I would say, how many words does your child use? And some parents would look at me puzzled and be like, they don't, they don't say any words. And I would stop and think, oh, that's right. And I should have probably said it in a different way. How does your child communicate with you? So how does your child let you know their wants and needs? It's so much, it's so much more effective to ask them, how do they let you know what they want? Are they pointing? Are they looking at you than looking at the object? Rather than how many words do they use? Receptive language is the ability to understand communication. It's evaluated most frequently in the clinic as a response to a request or a question. So we'll ask, do they follow directions? What do they do when you ask them to grab something for you? What about you asking them to grab something else? So one or two step um, questions or requests. So remember, a request to perform a gross motor task by a child who has a gross motor impairment. So for example, children with um, cerebral palsy may give a false impression of a child's receptive language skills because that child may still understand, but he cannot express with his motor skills a more useful method of assessing receptive language is to ask how the child responds to parental communication. So how does he respond when you ask him to do something? I won't go over all this. I know you can find this in many textbooks and over the internet, but there are a few things on here that we typically look at, and to us, they're the aha moments, the oh, this is something that I'm kind of concerned about, this is a red flag. And at around 10 to 12 months of age, we start to ask parents, does your child point? And when he points, does, is it typically to request something that he wants, so a desired object? And this typically develops around 10 to 12 months of age. And believe it or not, this pointing is very much different than the pointing that occurs at around 14 months of age, the proto-declarative pointing. And that's typically to express interest. So something as simple as pointing can go from I'm pointing to a desired object that I want to I'm now pointing at 14 months of age to a nice bird in the sky that I really want my mom to look at as well. So mind you, that pointing at 14 months is not only pointing. That child is sharing interest. It's that joint attention that we look for that is typically lagging or even is not even present in children with autism spectrum disorder. So that is a beautiful, beautiful one to see, and I, I usually get very, very excited at these small things when I see them at the clinic, because to me, they mean the world. If a child points to a clock and says, look, it's time to go, and then looks back at his mom. So that kind of pointing, to show interest or to express. For speech intelligibility, this typically is how much do the caregivers understand 
from what the child is saying. This is not a pop quiz, but if anyone knows, please shout out the answer. So at two years old, how much do you think you, could, you can start to understand from a child's speech? Approximately what percentage? Good job, residents. You're on the right path. Three years old? Awesome. Four years old? Awesome. Good job, guys. And then um, for language and speech delays, super, super important to emphasize the difference between a delay and a disorder. A delay can become a disorder, but a delay is not a disorder. They cannot be used interchangeably. Delay is the development of language or speech skills that is slower than that expected for their age. It's on the same developmental trajectory, it's just a little bit slower, meaning it will catch up because it is on that trajectory. A disorder is when those delays, be it in language and speech or fine motor, gross motor, when they persist to school age, they follow a different developmental trajectory, they're severe, and they begin to impact the child's functioning negatively. So children who show good symbolic play and or normal receptive language skills, despite expressive language uh, skills delays, have a better prognosis. This takes us back to initially when we said receptive language skills are key. Comprehensive pediatric assessment. So when a child comes to you with a concern for speech delay, it's I know it can be easy to just say, well, here you go, go to a speech pathologist or go see a developmental pediatrician, go see a neurologist. But again, it only takes a few more points of history taking, a good developmental history, and referring that child for an audiology examination. I cannot repeat that multiple times. It is so important to get that normal, regular results, that, that the hearing is within normal limits before making your referrals somewhere else. If you feel that on your developmental assessment, it is purely just speech and language related, and that is the only thing, and otherwise intact receptive language skills and social emotional um, development, you can go ahead and refer to speech therapy. If you have any other doubt about other forms of um, their development or other domains of their development, other than just pure language and speech skills, then please feel free to reach out to a developmental pediatrician a neurologist, psychologist, psychiatrist, depending on what services are available within that community. Red flags to kind of look at at six months of age, and these are language-related red flags. The child is not cooing responsively at six months. They're not babbling at 10 months. At 12 months, they're not gesturing, so they're not waving goodbye um, when you wave at them. At around 18 months of age, no words other than mama and dada, and no, no understanding of simple commands, and not pointing to what he wants. So again, go back. This says 18 months. You're probably thinking, well, you just said at around 12 months of age they should. But again, there's a window. It's not 12 months of age. Everyone needs to be taking their first steps. Everyone needs to be. You can go to a specific family. I mean, a lot of you who have children, if you have two or three children, they didn't all walk at 12 months. They didn't all wave goodbye at the same time. They didn't all point at the same age. Give them that time frame, that, that about six to, four to six month time frame. Not to say that we want to delay interventions, but there's differences from one child to the next. And I won't go through the rest because you guys can read those on your own. For risk factors, um, so a study in the US showed that children of lower socioeconomic statuses or poorer populations were exposed to an estimated 30 million fewer words than were children of higher socioeconomic statuses in their preschools. Again, emphasizing the importance of high quality daycare and high quality preschool in early childhood development, right? Because if you're from a lower or a lower SES community or poorer community, you don't have access to that. You're not getting sort of that, um, that the exposure to the language that you need to be using as compared to a higher SES community. Sex differences. So gender. Boys are a lot more prone to language disorder than girls. And we'll touch upon that in just a sec. Genetic factors. Going back, taking that really good history, right? So. When did the dad talk? When did the mom talk? What about the siblings? Do you have a family history of anyone who's speech delayed, hearing impaired, um, children with um, social communication disorders, autism spectrum disorder, going in and getting that proper history from the family? 
another little pop quiz. So myths versus facts. Speaking two or more languages to a child can confuse them. So it's better to only speak one language. Fact or myth? I hear a lot of myth. Any facts? Myth. We're all in agreement, thank you. This is kind of the bane of my existence is when I hear therapists say this in front of me that we suggested that they speak only one language in the home and I have my mini heart attack on the inside, but then I pull myself together and I tell them that all children are capable of learning multiple languages, including children with developmental delays and learning disabilities. Speak the language you're most comfortable speaking at home, please. So myth versus fact, again. It's better for families to only speak the language taught in school to their children, even if they do not speak the language well. Myth or fact, guys? Or you're just scared to tell them, I don't know. If it's, it's a myth. It's a myth, yeah. So families should always speak the language they're most comfortable speaking. And I used to see a lot of this in the US. I used to see a lot of Spanish-speaking families that have kids that go to English-speaking schools and the kids are fluent in English. They'll come in and they're talking and they're responding in English. Parents have no idea what they're saying. And the interaction between them, the bond between them is just so shattered just based on that language. And when I asked the mom, why aren't you speaking to him in Spanish? She says, well, he learns everything in English at school. I don't understand him, and I don't want him to lose his English language skills. It's more important for his future to speak in English than in Spanish. And I say, what about your community? What about your home? What about your relationship with the child, right? If she's not speaking to him and she's not communicating with him, who else is there? What, his peers at school? And, and then what? Right? So speaking in two different languages, or even more, bilingual, trilingual households, it helps with the development of the language centers of the brain. Children become bilingual just by listening to people around them speaking the second language. So just by listening, they become bilingual. Myth or fact? It's, it's a tricky one, I know. Fact? It's a myth, I know. It's okay. Um, so <laughs> learning language is an active process. It requires many opportunities for children to practice communicating. I kind of tricked you with that one, though, because listening is in there. Yeah, that was a trick from me. But and responding. So you're not expected to just listen. You're expect expected to listen and respond. They're both crucial for developing competence. So you guys didn't get that one wrong. That was on me. Bilingualism does not cause language delays and has been shown to improve children's ability to learn new words, identify sounds, and problem solve. If you take anything away from my lecture, please take this point away. Is this a myth or a fact? Thank you very much. That's literally everything we need to talk about. So common misconceptions. I hear this a lot in the Arab world. I'm originally Arab, so, so I understand the culture. And I hear a lot of, um, it's OK, he's a boy. They're more delayed. They take time. His brother Muhammad was nine when he first started talking. And I say, no. Cultural differences, but no. We actually said earlier on in my presentation that boys are more, more prone to speech and language disorders, right? Meaning they actually need to be screamed more vigilantly and then seeing that any delays that they have be monitored more closely. It doesn't mean they'll end up with a disorder, but they're at higher risk. So actually you just saying it's a boy, it's fine, that's okay, turn them away. You're actually delaying interventions. And that goes back to my lecture from yesterday. The earlier you intervene, the better the outcomes. So please, 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 if you hear any of these misconceptions in the community, he's a boy, it's fine, she's a girl, she'll be okay, it doesn't matter. Both the genders need to be evaluated and you need to follow them closely, especially boys. Bilingual households, I've talked about this way too much, I won't go over that, that's a common misconception. Never tell someone to just speak one language in their home, unless that's all they speak, that's fine. Child's birth order, this was, this was kind of a new one to me when I, when I started um, my, my kind of my training. People would come to me and say, well, he was the firstborn child, so that's fine. He talks a little bit better than the secondborn. It does not matter. A child's birth order, whether they're the first, second, third, fourth born, it does not matter. 
they all will have a similar development overall, but if there are delays, then it does not matter what birth order that they're in. They will not cat just catch up. They need to be evaluated at the same time. A study was done to show that th their results was that basically, I believe that the firstborn uh, child that to the family reached the 50 word vocabulary mark a little bit sooner than the second or third born, but eventually the second and third caught up so that the total vocabulary they had was exactly the same. And so it really doesn't make a difference. Everyone needs to be evaluated if you feel like there is a significant delay. Social emotional milestones, I think this is a really, really big one, especially in the world of autism spectrum disorders. Um, a few really important milestones we want to talk about. Um, at 10 months, they start to respond to their name. That's a really, really big one. Um, for, for families, when they come in, they'll say, he really, he just ignores me. And if you have that, that normal audiology evaluation, it's kind of a red flag. Why is he not responding to his name at around 10 to 12 months? 12 to 14 months, we talked about pointing and how that's different from, from the- Five minutes. Um, thank you. Um, different from the 14 to 15 month old pointing to share interest. A few um, kind of things I want to go over with, with regards to social development. So the attachment theory, I know someone talked about this yesterday, but it's a caregiver's response to the child's cry and other behaviors, and the infant gains confidence in the caregiver's accessibility and responsiveness. This actually inter like, is kind of linked very closely to stranger anxiety. So why do some children have stronger forms of stranger anxiety than others? So the stronger the attachment, between child and caregiver, the stronger that bond, not to say that they're bad or good parents, it's just the stronger the attachment, the, the more stranger anxiety you'll see in that specific child. Because that's their ability to distinguish between familiar versus unfamiliar around six months of age. So if they're very much attached to the parents, every time they cry, their mom is on cue, she's there, she holds them, she picks them up, then you get that more exaggerated stranger anxiety around six months of age. And I gave you that example of the mo mother that comes in at around four months and says he was smiling at his aunt and his uncle and his grandmother and he was playful and he didn't mind being held by them. But at six, seven months, this is a nervous child. I'm worried. What if he's autistic? What if, and definitely not, this is a normal um, milestone, developmental milestone. Joint attention, huge one, shared interest. So joint attention or shared interest, it develops around 12 to 14 months of age. That's around the same time that we expect them to point at things that they're interested in. So it's a process whereby the infant and caregiver share an experience. So we're both looking at the blue bird in the sky and we recognize the experience is being shared. So myself and my child are both looking at the bird in the sky we realize that we're both looking at the bird in the sky and we're enjoying it. We're sharing that shared enjoyment, that joint attention. Very, very, very big milestone to hit. Even though a lot of us don't seem to pay much attention to it, those of you who have kids, if they share attention and they're joined or they're joining their interests with you, that's a big, big, big milestone. And a lot of the times parents will come in and that could be the main kind of chief complaint. He doesn't really care much for me being in the room. He doesn't really point to things that he's interested in. He doesn't show me that the, the sky is blue and he wants to look at it or he's interested in a bird flying in the sky. And that's a red flag for autism spectrum disorders. Play, again, I've talked about this briefly at the beginning and talked about how beautiful it is to watch a child play. At around 18 months of age, we watch them start to have simple pretend play, even from as early as 12 months, where they start to have more of the imitation play. A brush comes to the hair, I'm imitating mom brushing her hair. A spoon comes to the mouth, or I'm feeding the baby. So I'm doing something that I see is being done around me. And then later on at around 30 months of age, that extends and that expands into the child using an object, not what it's intended for, just like a block, and use that as a telephone rather than picking up an actual telephone, we're using another object for that. So that's more complex pretend play. And the most beautiful of all, 36, to, 36 months to about four months of age, where they start to share. They start to share and they start to involve others into their play. So you'll see kids come up with a make-believe story and they realize there's someone else around them playing with them. Whereas the two-year-old, the 24-month-old is sitting side by side with another child, so parallel playing, the four-year-old is actually playing the same game as their peer and interacting with them accordingly.
Thank you very much. I have a question for Dr. Dalal. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I wanted to ask about bilingual families. So right now, like a lot of families who speak Arabic and English, they would speak Arabic and English in the same sentence. So does it affect the child development if you speak two languages in the same sentence itself? It's still the same. Yeah. We still recommend speaking both, whether you're speaking in the middle of the sentence, beginning of a sentence, I'm like that too, I am bilingual and I'll use a mixture of both and I was exposed to both as a child as well. And so it, it does not make a difference, but that's a really good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? My question is also for Dr. Dalal. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I see kids uh, that they will come at uh, one, one and a half years still, okay, is he's forming any words? No, uh, but some families, then the reason sometimes when how many hours you spend talking to the child, um, especially now with the devices. I had a child with the, not speaking, but actually three hours a day on the device. Then when we try to eliminate that, and I tell them like, just focus on three words every week, whatever most important to him, let them express. So to be honest, I didn't know what's your opinion regarding if that approach before doing the referral or it might delay some pickups. That's a really good question. So what I typically tell my patients, talk to your children, sing with your children, read with your children. Put that device down, replace it with a book, whether it's at bedtime for a good hour, whether it's during the day when they come home from school. Put the device down, reduce that screen time, increase the time reading. Reading is key with language development. So what I would say to that parent, if other milestones are appropriately being reached, then I would probably just watch and wait, but closely. So not come back in three years, come back in three to six months. Let's see how we're doing. Before they leave, hand them a book. I don't know how things are done here yet, but I plan for my clinic to always have a bookshelf, and I usually let the kids before they leave pick out a book. And I'll usually get the answer is, no, I want to be on my iPad. Or no, I'm more interested in the Legos you're about to give me before I leave. But I say, no, let's pick one out together. And maybe you can read it to mom or dad. And even if they're not at that age, let them imagine what they're reading. And even when you're reading to your child, it doesn't have to be word for word. You can come up with a story together. You can make that event more fun for them rather than giving them the tablet. So reading to your child, singing to your child, and just speaking with your child as well. We didn't have the time um, for your, the indication for the kidney biopsy, if you don't mind sharing with us. Okay, so uh, it was one of my slides, but I could not teach to that. So the indication for biopsy, it depends on the timing. So the absolute indication if you have a steroid resistant child, because you need to know where you are with this child first. Does it really fall into that primary nephrotic syndrome or is it um, something else like secondary nephrotic syndrome? Especially if you don't have the facilities to get all the immunological workup done. So a steroid resistant for sure is one. If you have a child with an acute kidney injury coming to you with the first presentation of nephrotic syndrome along with kidney injury or acute kidney failure, it used to be called, those patients, if they are not improving over the next few days, you're giving them albumin and diuretics, still not passing much urine, high, high blood pressure, numbers are getting worse, those patients also are, um, need to be biopsied. Children who are below one year of age, like congenital nephrotic, no, we are, it used to be years ago, people need to, uh, you, like did the biopsy, but now with the privilege of having the genetic testing, handy, easy, accessible, and by definition, if less than one year of age, it's a congenital nephrotic, we do not biopsy them. So the, I would say the absolute one, acute kidney injury, not responding over the next, say, week, or the first week of treatment. Second, it is steroid-resistant children. All, or if you have a clear secondary nephrotic syndrome, like lupus, for example, presenting a nephrotic syndrome, but they are not because of their immunological 
um, other markers is looking for toward that because we know in lupus, for example, you need to know which class of lupus is affected in the kidney that will affect your treatment either acutely or long term, and there what you will counsel the family about the outcome. Hello. The question is to Dr. Dalal. So you've spoken about the attachment theory and how, of course, attachment is important because the child needs to establish that relationship with the mom. But at the same time, you mentioned that it will cause more stranger fear. It will be, become more exaggerated. Were there any studies seeing the child in the near future, whether the development of independence or skills has been affected by this bond? Because sometimes, especially in the Middle Eastern area, especially when they're weaning off the child, they'll be like, okay, let him cry for a while, don't immediately jump to bed, especially that this will make it harder. So were there any studies comparing this attachment theory? To Not that I know of, but wow, because if we could tell how independent we were gonna be from just knowing how much stranger anxiety we had, I'm telling you, this world would be an interesting place. That's for sure. I'll, I'll look into that, but, or maybe that's something we can work on together. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, basically, there's two actually. One of them is we're told with the masks and COVID that there is obviously an increasing incidence or you know, people are finding children with more language delay. Are you seeing that in your own practice here? So here being US for me, because I just moved here for sure, huge, huge, huge mental health crisis that we had lots and lots and lots of more exaggerated language delays, delays specifically, um, and not just with language, we were seeing a lot of social emotional delays, a lot more anxiety, a lot more depression. Our core ASD, autism spectrum disorder symptoms were a lot more pronounced, rigidity was much worse, and it was so much more difficult to get from that stage to going back to school. So not only are we changing their routine for the pandemic, we're now changing back to kind of socializing and expecting more from children from a social standpoint and language standpoint, so absolutely is something we saw a lot more of an exaggerated reaction. It was a huge, huge, huge mental health crisis. Our wait lists went up from 18 months to about um, 24 months um, to come in and see us. And same for psychiatrists. And I think they were bouncing back between us and psychiatry because no one knew what to do because of the wait list. Thank you. Um, the last question I have is about awareness of, of language because we're fortunate, we're obviously in, many children will come for their well um, checkups to their pediatrician, um, but there are gonna be a group of children that aren't seen regularly um, for various reasons. You know, what do you think in terms of impact of awareness within the sort of nurseries and schools in terms of, you know, all the myths that you talk about here and actually giving people sort of those facts such that they're more likely to empower them to pick up those delays themselves without even having to see a, a professional. Right, right. There are many apps that are being used in the U.S. where you, and I think someone brought up, I think Dr. Zainab talked about an app, but I'm at. I didn't know about this till yesterday, where you could look up your child's age versus where they're supposed to be developmentally, and then you yourself as the, as the caregiver can say, oh, they're not there yet or what am I supposed to be looking out for? So definitely using more of those apps, if they're used appropriately, of course, um, and just going into the community, going into schools, um, and educating, and going into healthcare centers, primary care centers, um, general pediatricians. It's a scary thing to, to tackle, but just going in there and educating more and more of the community, and I feel like we can get there, and we are getting there with a lot of the really, really great initiatives that are going on, but these are usually trapped tracked via apps in the US. And other than the apps, one thing that I, I really loved there was the early intervention programs. I spoke about that yesterday. And I know we're starting to do those here. There are multiple um, early intervention programs, not per se like the programs in the US as to what they do exactly. But I hope that we can have that system in the near future where myself as a caregiver or the teacher or um, the general pediatrician feels like there's a question mark about this child's development. Hey, early intervention agency, please can you go into the child's home and just kind of screen them and figure out what's going on? Because then there's no harm in them screening them and say, nope, we're good, 
the child's a-okay or yeah no i don't i think something else is going on we need to start going into the school we need to start therapies while you wait to be seen by the developmental pediatrician so there's intervention going on before they come in to see us we're not losing time so i think that's what we should strive to move towards and i'm, I'm hoping that's what we will end up doing someday but thank you for the question but i will ask you a general question in this country everything is insurance driven so now as a general pediatrician, we see many children's and families with speech delay. So first question, where I should refer to speech therapist or a developmental pediatrician? Now, there are very less developmental pediatrician and dedicated center here, first. Second comes the money. Third comes the process. Fourth comes here families, all mother, father, they are working and child in the daycare or in some other places or taken care by the caregivers. So how you are finding here, and how is a general pediatrician as a community in UAE we should deal with this situation? That's a really good question. And I feel like probably I can answer you better in six months because I haven't started practicing here just yet. Um, but with regards to insurance, I mean, I wish I could say it in a different way, but having a child with a neurodisability can be expensive. And I know this firsthand. I have a nephew who's currently 13. He's thriving. He's doing wonderfully. He's on the autism spectrum disorder. But I know firsthand how much money goes into his therapies, his ABA, his speech, his OT, his shadow teacher that goes in at school. It does take a lot. I wish the world was different. But unfortunately, we're just not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, with regards to um, sort of where to refer, if you were to choose one, for me to make my life a little bit easier, get a hearing evaluation just at first, and then figure out if there's other developmental, mi so knowing the normal developmental milestones, figure it out, if, is there more than one domain that's delayed? Is it just the speech and language, but the, but the hearing is okay, and he's a social child, he's understanding, his receptive language is okay, that's fine. Have him see a speech therapist, and there's no harm putting in a referral to see us as well, but they'll get the intervention before seeing us as well. And timing is key. I, I wish things were, because in the US, we're covered by Medicaid, and a lot of the insurances, and people are still not happy. They see us, and they'll they have a ABA 40, 45 hours a week. They're still, we're just, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. It, mental health needs, has a long way to go. Has a long way to go. But thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Imad can join the stage for the pediatric neurology questions. <laughs> any, <laughs> any question for the neurology? Thank you, Dr. Antisar, and thank you, Dr. Delal, for the beautiful presentations. And I would also like to thank the both moderators. Yes. And can we give the gifts, please? Just, uh, Dr. Antisar, please. Yeah, okay. Give the first one, Dr. Should I just give it like that? Just like this? I know I'm not good like this. Okay. Oh, okay. 